how would we be even willing to die for the name of Christ, right? Like even when we think about that moment uh, with Jesus in the garden, not my will, but your will. I don't want to do this, but I will. I'll surrender it. I'll surrender it to the point of death, to the point of the ultimate sacrifice. And if we're being conformed into his image, how can we be conformed into the image of Christ if we cannot be yielded and submitted to the Father the way he was? So I thought we could use as an encouragement, a reminder of those who went before us. Um, the great cloud of witness um, of people who who waited. And at the very ultimate example, um, Jesus himself, right? So Luke 3.23, Jesus was 30 years old when he began his ministry. 30 years he waited. For a three-year ministry. If anyone was ready to step out and do it before the right timing, it was Jesus. And yet there were so many things that were coming together in order for it to be politically the right time, socially the right time, linguistically the right time. There are so many things that were happening in the background in order for Jesus's ministry to have the uh, relevant effectiveness that it required. Not to say that it wouldn't have been effective if he didn't wait that time, but there were things that were coming together in order for it to do what it needed to do for the people who were there who needed to be there, right? So. Jesus firstly, and then we think about David. I don't know about you guys, but I really like David. I love that God refers to him as a man of, after his own heart. And so this makes me very inherently curious about David because how do we become people after God's own heart in the same way? Like how could we be reflected in his eyes in the same way with the same kind of um like that's that's how you would how God would reference you, right? A woman after God's own heart. Um, not to say again, we're like striving for it in terms of working for that relationship because we're saved through faith alone. But I like to know about the people who really touch God and he felt he could rely on them. And so when we think about David, there seems to be a little bit of variation with David's life, but what we what I've seen consistently is like between seven to eight years that he ran from Saul before he was made king. And so there was the time where he was in the palace before he was running. Um, I believe that was seven years. And then there was another, and then it was a breakdown of another approximately seven to eight years in which he was running, right? So when we think of the accumulation of all of that time that he was being faithful and waiting on the promise of God and to think of how young he was when he was anointed king. And then to go back, um, to continue to shepherd the sheep and, and to trust that the Lord would bring that to pass. And to maintain heart when he's running. Like, could you imagine how frightening it would be to be pursued by a king who has every resource at his disposal. Okay. Joseph. So Genesis 37, two, Joseph at 17 years old, he is sold into slavery. And he is not in the position of being in the service of Pharaoh until he's 30 years old. So that's Genesis 41, 46. We think about that, right? 13 years. So in 13 years, this is where he is a slave. This is where he is under Potiphar's reign. It says that he was in, he was in jail for two years. 
um, before he was even able to translate the dream for Pharaoh. So the people before us have waited. And let's go to the final one, Esther. Okay, so there's no indication of how old Esther is concretely. Um, so it seems like speculation is between 14 to 17 years old, which is like, just think of the youth of this. Like, think of your, like people who you know that are 14 to 17 years old. And imagine this is the time that they're preparing to marry the king. Okay? So, to, so what happens is you have, we'll say Esther was 15, like, for the sake of um, clarity. And it, it takes five years before the execution of Haman. So she's married to Xerxes. And then we see that there's an approximate five-year gap before we see everything come to pass in terms of her um, standing up for her people, right? For the Jewish people. Just like the time that like, it wasn't that as soon as she got married, she was prepared immediately to do that, right? There was still a time of waiting before what she was called to do actually happened. So this is, <laughs> this is a kind of a question that the Lord had positioned to me too. And it stung, if I can be honest with you. So I'm going to position it to you and it might sting a little bit and cause some conviction, which is why do you think you're exempt from waiting? I'm going to let that sink in. Why do you think you're exempt? And the fact is, is we're not. We're not exempt. We're all going through a process of sanctification. We've been sanctified and now we're going through the process of sanctification. We're being conformed into the image of Christ and the who Christ is slash is was is um who Christ is is the epitome of love this is where we see the fruit of the spirit right like if we think about just you know love joy patience you know peace long suffering like when we think about all of those qualities or we think about the definition of love love is patient love is kind love holds a record of wrong um, when we think about the calling of the Christian and then we ask ourselves like, God, like why me? Why do I have to wait this long? And so in the shadow of Jesus waiting 30 years, <laughs> in the shadow of waiting, like David will say seven to eight years of pursuit and of fleeing for his life and more on top of that when he was chosen we think of 13 years when we're dealing with joseph and we think of potentially from the time that esther believed she was going to be married five years and more in preparation and waiting for the king when we think of like being in the shadow of that, right? And we think of we're waiting for one year, we're waiting for four, we're waiting for two years, and we feel like God is taking way too long. And like, again, I have felt that too. And that is why I wanted, I'm speaking to this, because this is a time where we can feel very weary, is this in-between space. And the fact is, we're not exempt. We're not special snowflakes the way culture likes to, you know, curate for people that they feel like they are exempt from the difficulties of life or that their traumas or hardships um, exempt them from, you know, the, the burden that life brings. And the fact is the rain falls on the just and the unjust. We are all called to carry our own cross. And that is waiting sometimes. That is trusting in the Lord. That is walking by faith and not by sight. It is knowing that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Even when you have 
nothing in front of you that formally confirms it. We know that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so when we're low in faith and when we are weary and we are waiting, we can ask the Lord to help our unbelief. And we can continue to hold on to God's promises, encouraging one another, spurring one another on, and remembering that nothing is ever wasted. Anyways, I hope this was an encouragement. Thank you for being with me. And I wish you a wonderful week, day, night, wherever you are.